fact, it is uh, 30 minutes to 10 o'clock. And, well, you heard the story just a few weeks ago about uh, a South African man returning from Thailand and um, returning after being pardoned by the Thai king. Um, He was first given a life sentence, spent 18 years in a Thai jail and miraculously returned back to South Africa to his family um, just a few weeks ago. And I'm talking about Shani Krebs, Alexander Shani Krebs, who is in the Chai FM studios with us today. So Shani, good morning. Morning, how are you doing? Well, I'm very good. I I said you must be absolutely exhausted, inundated. Well, I'll tell you something, this cold weather is actually actually keeping me away. <laughs> <laughs> You're not used to this cold weather? No, nah, not at all. I mean, Thailand, the temperatures are hot all year round. So, so back to back to Joburg winters. Yeah. Oh, man. It's oh, terrible. Back to Joburg. <laughs> but but if, I just want to put it out there that the lines are open okay. um, and you can SMS us if you have anything to say to Shani, if you want to ask a question, if you want to share a story, whatever it is, call us on 0861 24 24 36, SMS us on 34519. I mean, it was just, it was in December when we heard this terrible story about this um, South African drug mule who was executed in China, Shani, and she was she was arrested in 2008. I think she was carrying something like three kilograms of meta, metaphetamines. Um, and yeah, Janice Bronwyn Linden. Yeah. And she, she was executed. <coughs> and we just look at the statistics and we look at how many South African drug mules and that currently there are more than 619 South Africans in prisons oh. around the world for drug smuggling. It's a huge number. Yeah, it is. It is a huge number. And a lot of them are in Brazilian jails. So so let's just talk about your story because there are so many. I mean, it was just a, a couple of weeks after this um, uh, uh, poor Janice who was executed that a, another young lady was caught in Thailand. She was, she was you know, wearing, uh, she had drugs in her dreadlocks and, and she was caught. And this just seems to be an ongoing problem. But we're not here just to talk about the, 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 the drug mules and, and the, 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 the smuggling of drugs, although it is important because I do think that you you are going to have a very strong message. Yeah. Um, you know, your return to South Africa, there is a strong message because if it is so prevalent in South Africa, um, it's not on the, the decrease, it's certainly on the increase. To hear your story, I think a lot of people need to listen to what happened to you yeah. and, and, and how it happened to you. <coughs> I mean, you were, what, 34 years old That's when you correct. were caught, Shani? Yeah. What, what, what happened? You, you had gone to, your sister had sent you to Thailand, hadn't she? Well, actually, I was uh, planning to go on holiday day um, mm-hmm. after I had a breakup with my fiance. Um, during that time, I was approached by somebody. They learned through my friends that I was going to Thailand. So it was like a last minute thing. Asked me to to pick up some drugs for them, you know, and they were going to give me like quite a bit of money. Mm. Um, I thought, well, once I'm there, I mean, you know, I might as well do it. I'd take a risk. And uh, actually, just to get back to your last point about uh, I'm surprised about these recent South Africans being arresting, arrested because my case was extensively uh, publicized, uh, so there, there should have been a greater awareness because uh, Thailand and a lot of Asian countries don't tolerate the drug trafficking, mm. and the consequences are very serious. Mm. Um, Thailand, the, the sentencing is either death penalty or life sentence, mm. which is 100 years. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, we need to do more to deter people and the youth of today to get involved in in drug trafficking. Mm, and I'm sure you feel from your experience that you are going to be a great messenger when it comes yeah, to I, this. Yeah, I'm sharing my experience mm. in the hope that people become more aware yeah, and, yeah. and especially to learn the consequences. I mean, I had no idea of that Thailand had the death penalty. I knew Malaysia had the death penalty and Singapore. So you didn't know I the d- real dangers when I, you agreed to take not, those drugs? Absolutely not. Even when I was caught, I thought, well, you know, maybe I can get out of this somehow. But <laughs> it didn't mm. happen. Shani, you, I mean, you went to King David Victory Park, didn't That's you? That's correct. Um, my kids go to King David Victory Park. Okay, cool. We parkers. So, I mean, going to King David Victory Park, your family, I know how tirelessly your, your sister fought to try and get you out of jail, mm. not seeing your mom for, for a long time. Did you come from a strong Jewish family, a, a strong background? Was it more traditional mm. or religious? Definitely traditional. I mean, I grew up in Arcadia, mm-hmm. which is the South African Jewish home in Parktown. Uh, we used to go to th- shul three times a day. Actually, in standard nine and ten, I was the chazan, so mm. I used to conduct the service. So yes, I come from a strong back, uh, Jewish background. 
And so go, just going back to you agreeing to take these drugs, you didn't know um, that the kind of punitive uh, measures that could be taking, uh, taken if you were caught smuggling the drugs. But obviously it never occurred to you that you would be caught. You know, and, and I don't think it would occur to any of these drug mules who are smuggling drugs in or out of the country that they are going to be caught. I mean, I, I, I did know that I was taking a risk and that there was a chance of being caught, but... Uh, throughout my life, I just seem to get away with so much. You mm. know, I mean, I do have a history of, of drug abuse and mm. and uh, selling drugs in Johannesburg, and I kind of always got away with it, you know. Mm. So I thought, well, I mean, let's take a chance. So you were in Thailand. You Did, did you smuggle the drugs into Thailand? And no, then you, no okay. I was in Thailand. I actually met up with the people in a hotel, and the deal was made. Mm. Um, then it was delivered to my hotel in a bag, which had a secret compartment. I mean, I tried to look for it. If you didn't know it was there, there, it would be impossible to find. It was really done professionally. And I stayed there for about 10 days. In that time, I partied, went out, got drunk, got into a couple of fights. So I actually had quite a good time. Mm. And uh, I wasn't aware that I was being watched. Um, the taxi driver who took me to the airport was actually an undercover narcotics agent. And I was kind of set up because when I got there, they were waiting for me. How come, how, so they, they must have been following, well, you were just, I mean, you were just the mule, but yeah. they must have been following the drug dealers all of this time. I mean, were you were you the only one caught in this whole sting operation? Yeah, I was the only one caught. Uh, meetings were set up clandestinely, so, I mean, I made sure I wasn't followed when I went to the meetings, when I met with the guys. Uh, I was interrogated, but um, I just said I didn't know who the people were. And when you were interrogated, I mean, was there any type of abuse? Uh, they, yeah, they got a little bit heavy with me and punched me around a little bit, but nothing serious. Okay. So when you got to the airport, you had no idea that you were being followed, but you were very much being followed. When did you get an idea that things were going horribly wrong? Um, only when I actually was giving in my, when I arrived at the departure section, the section that I was going through, it was completely isolated. There was nobody there. Uh, just just the, the woman who was taking my passport, and mm -hmm. I thought, this is kind of unusual. I can't mm -hmm. be the only person on the flight. Mm -hmm. So they had actually especially uh, evacuated the people from that part. They were on in radio communication. So when I ended my passport, uh, I turned uh, through the corner of my eye, I saw like a lot of guys in black uniform with machine guns and they came and they apprehended me. And your first thought, Shani, when that <laughs> happened? I was shocked. Mm -hmm. I just thought, okay, well, that's it, I'm bust. You okay. know? But you still thought, oh, I'm going to get out of it. Oh, <laughs> well, this is I, I'll get out of this. Well, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I had no idea. I mean... The Thai judicial system is so inconsistent, and uh, um, even if you, even if if you are caught, say say you have drugs on you, and the guy next to you, there's somebody in the in your close vicinity, they'll arrest everybody, and even though you're innocent, you can be found guilty by association. No. Okay, so I'm going to take a break, but, but cool. before we do, I just want to ask you one question. How would you describe yourself as a person when you were arrested? I mean, you talk about, um, you know, you sold drugs, you, you took drugs, you, you were associated with drug dealers. H how would you describe yourself at that point in your life? Well, I mean, I'd grown up on the streets. So I, I, I was adventurous. I, I would take risk. Um, I was wild. Uh, irresponsible, you name it. I mm. mean, I, I was a bad guy. Mm. Mm. We're going to take a break, Shani. Okay, Thank cool. you so much. Okay. 101.9 FM, 101.9 megahertz of power. Welcome back. Um, we have Alexander Shani Krebs in the studio who returned just a few weeks ago um, after being imprisoned for 18 years in a Thai jail. And Shani is just sharing his story with us because this really is um, a story that a lot of people need to hear when we talk about the terrible statistics of the drug mules. And, you know, there are a lot of impressionable people out there and also how people can change and how, how things change over time. If you have any questions for Shani, um, the lines are open on 0861 24 24 36. You can SMS us on 34519. So Shani, we're going back to that awful day when you were arrested okay. um, and you were taken off and you were interrogated. Um, when when did you know? Um, I mean, there was a there was a whole court case. How, how did the court case work? Well, um, I, was, I was apprehended at the airport then I was taken to a police station. I was held at the police station for seven days and then, then I had my first court appearance. Um... I went into court. I don't know what was going on. Every th all the procedures were in Thai. Um, there were many, many of us. And uh, 
then then we were taken to a prison and uh, from the time we got to the prison after that you got to appear eight times eight times in court over every two weeks you go about eight times before they sentence you but uh I pleaded guilty. Obviously, I was guilty. Mm -hmm. Initially, I thought I would try to fight the case. But after speaking to all the other fellow inmates, they said I'd be crazy to fight it because it was in my possession and there was no ways I would get away with it. Mm -hmm. The reason why I wanted to fight it was because they knew exactly where the drugs were. They didn't even check my other suitcases. I had like three, three, four suitcases and I had the the bag with the heroin in. And when they apprehended me, they went straight to that bag. Mm -hmm. So I thought on those grounds maybe I can fight something as a setup. But then after I learned that it would it would be it would be futile futile because I would get the death sentence anyway. So uh, after eight appearances, I was sentenced. Did the did the were you in contact with the South African embassy at all with the South African government? Yes, uh, the South Af- I did contact the South African embassy from the police station. They did come there and, and visit me. Uh, it was it's quite funny because at the time when 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 I when I was at the police cells, there were three four South African girls. And when when I, when I met them and I asked them, I said to them, "Well, have you contacted the embassy?" They, and they weren't even aware that there was an embassy. So, they, of course, there's an embassy. So I managed to get the mm. police to call the embassy, and they came down and they visited all of us. I managed to give them some of my personal possessions, which they they sent home to my family. I mean, this all happened a day before the first democratic elections took That's place in correct. South Africa. <laughs> I mean, correct. when you just think about that, yeah. you know, you kind of disappeared into obscurity while South Africa was experiencing the most tremendous time in history. Yeah. Do you know, you you got sucked away yeah. and now we, I mean, we're going to get there to reappear in this completely new country. Okay, so so you were then told you were given a, a you were then sentenced, yeah. um, a life sentence. No, I got it. I got the death penalty, which was commuted to life. Okay, yeah. and when you how how long after that was it commuted to life? I mean, for no, how it's, long it's, it's actually kind of automatic. Okay. Once once they, if you plead guilty, you get the death sentence, and then it's automatically okay. commuted to okay. life, which is equivalent to a hundred years. And Johnny, how did you feel? I mean, when you were told that this this is this is where you were going to stay for the rest of your life, did you believe it? Uh, well, I mean, you know, you're in a state of shock. Uh, my sister was there, so I had to put up a ba- brave front for her because I knew she was going to come back home, and I didn't want her to, to uh, you know, be be all emotional about it. Which I mean, obviously she was. Uh, it was a, it was a hell of a shock, but I mean, I I didn't I had no idea what a life sentence even meant. It didn't register. Okay, mm. you know, it doesn't register like like what's life. I thought maybe it's twenty years. I think in those days in South Africa, life sentence was twenty. Mm. I had no idea it's going to be a hundred years. You know, and life in the prisons. Um, you know, it's kind of tough. I mean, especially uh, the culture, the different culture. But uh, I think, you know, man by nature is quite resilient and you adapt to your environment. I mean, you have to survive. Um, it was tough. I've been to five different prisons. And uh, anyway, I mean, it, it was hard. And and I mean, the, the, the way you were treated, obviously, there were there must have been lots of other foreigners in the prisons as well. Did you gravitate towards them? Um, it was difficult because a lot of the foreigners were using drugs. Um, so in the prisons? I, yeah, yeah. They're, they're drugs they're, readily available in the prisons, Shani? Well, it's, it's, it's all over the world. I mean, mm. if they didn't have drugs in the prison, I think they'd have a riot. You know? So it's just to kind of pacify the really? guys. Yeah. Mm. So, I, I mean, there were a lot of foreigners. And, and I mean, we did kind of stick together, those of us who weren't on drugs. And Shani, um, for you, I mean, you were, you were doing drugs while you were caught, weren't you? Yeah, before I was caught, yeah. And when you went into jail, did you continue with drugs? At what point did you then stop? Well, for the first year, I did smoke a bit of hashish. Uh, I took some LSD, um, but then I decided to stop. So for, uh, for the first year, I didn't use much because, I, I mean, it's not the kind of environment where you really want to get high, you know. Mm, so, mm. What made you stop? Um, you know, I think uh, my family and it's just seeing seeing other guys. Um, I mean, the 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 popular drug at that time was heroin. I, d- I wasn't really into heroin, and just seeing the guys passed out and, and constantly high and s- constantly hustling to get a fix, and I kind of saw myself, you know, and I just I, I, I couldn't believe that I was like that because mm. I'd been I'd been like the first year I was pretty straight. I mean, I didn't smoke cash every day. It wasn't available and it was expensive. So, so it was an eye opener for me, just seeing so many other people, uh, you know, being screwed up on drugs. Well, that you that you were able in that situation to remove yourself and see yourself as this individual and see them. 
I think was the beginning of a transformation. Must have been. Yeah, for you. yeah, definitely. I mean, mm. I understood that I was going to have to change, you know. Mm. And also, the thing is, in Thai prisons, you basically got to fend for yourself. Um, the food's inedible, so so we would have to rely on our families to send us money. And I knew my my family was struggling, you know, and to make ends meet, and they were still uh, providing me with money so I could live on. And I just couldn't squander that on drugs. Yeah. 